Buenos días, hoy es 26 de enero del 2021. Gracias a toda la audiencia que nos sintoniza en tiempo real y a las que nos sigue en otro momento, les damos la más cordial bienvenida a la serie de seminarios del Instituto de Biología. Y antes de comenzar, comenzar quiero, eh, estamos eh, muy contentos de anunciar que ya eh, tenemos el calendario de la nueva serie de seminarios eh, de fronteras en sistemática, biodiversidad y evolución. Esta nueva serie de seminarios que va a estar inmersa en, las, en los seminarios institucionales, eh, tenemos fechas que les solicitamos que las apunten en sus agendas y aquí les pongo en la pantalla los conferencistas que nos van a estar dando sus charlas. Eh, también tenemos una página web que también está en el chat de este, eh, de este canal, de este seminario, donde pueden ir eh, viendo los títulos de las conferencias que se van a dar y les solicitamos de la manera más atenta que nos ayuden a darle promoción a este evento eh, que va a ser, eh, se, va a, se va a llevar a cabo por primera vez en el Instituto de Biología. Good morning to all the audience following us real time or in later occasions. We welcome you to the weekly seminar series of the Institute of Biology at UNAM. And we are very glad to announce the new seminar series, Frontiers in Systematics, Biodiversity and Evolution. So feel free to check our website uh, listed here in the, in the chat. And please feel free to, uh, to share these links or to share this seminar series with your peers. Eh, Le solicitamos amablemente que se registren en esta plataforma de YouTube para entonces poder interactuar en el chat, primeramente con su nombre, su procedencia y nivel académico, y segundo, para poder recibir sus comentarios y preguntas para el expositor del día de hoy. Es a través de este chat que les haremos llegar sus preguntas y comentarios al final de la conferencia al invitado de hoy. Before starting, we kind, kindly ask you to sign in YouTube so you can register your name and affiliation in the chat. Also, we will receive your comments and questions for our speaker through this chat. El día de hoy tenemos a un distinguido conferencista, el Dr. Dan Chitwood de la Michigan State University. Dan recibió su doctorado de Cold Spring Harbor Lab y trabajó con la doctora Marja Timbermans en el movimiento de RNAs pequeños en el desarrollo de las hojas. Después, para su doctorado, trabajó con la doctora Nelima Ciña de la Universidad de California en Davis para estudiar la variación natural en jitomate y sus parientes silvestres. Fue ahí mismo, en el laboratorio de Nelima, que Dan comenzó a trabajar con métodos para cuantificar la forma, para detectar y mapear las variaciones sutiles de estas formas entre especies. Ahora, Dan es investigador de Michigan State University, donde continúa su trabajo con estos métodos para cuantificar la forma utilizando tomografía computarizada de rayos X en 3D. Y el día de hoy hablará sobre el uso de estos datos topológicos, métodos matemáticos y cómo se extrae la información de grandes cantidades de, de estos tipos de datos para cuantificar la forma. Dan received his PhD from Cold Spring Harbor Lab, working with Marja Timmermans, studying the intercellular movement of small RNAs and their contributions to patterning leaves. He did his PhD, uh, his postdoc, uh, with Dr. Nelly Massinia at the University of California, Davis, studying natural variation in tomato and wild relatives. It was in Sinia's lab that Dan started working on methods to quantify shape to detect and genetically map subtle effects on leaf shape between species. Dan is now at Michigan State University, where he continues to work on methods to quantify the plant form in 3D using X-ray computed tomography. And today he will be talking about using topological data analysis, TDA, a field of math to comprehensively extract information from large complex data sets by measuring uh, their shape. So welcome to the uh, Institute of Biology seminar series, Dan. So now the microphone is yours. Everybody can see that? Yes, I can see it. Thank you, Ulises, for the wonderful uh, introduction and for the invitation to speak today at UNAM. Um, it's a great honor for me to speak at UNAM. I, I really wish that there wasn't the pandemic and I could be there in person with you all today in Mexico City. 
Um, and welcome to everybody else outside of Mexico City that is attending today. Um, it's a very dark, cold, and snowy day in Michigan today, so I really wish I was in Mexico. Uh, today, I'll be talking about topological data analysis. This is a field of mathematics that has a very powerful vision about how we think about data. TDA says that all shapes are a type of data and that all data has shape and that we can quantify it. And I'll be talking today about how we can apply topological data analysis to quantifying plant morphology. I'll be talking today uh, a lot about uh, measuring the shape of barley seeds. And this is the work of Erika Mezquita. Uh, he did his undergraduate research project at CMET in uh, Guanajuato, the Mathematical Institute. And he's co-advised by me and Elizabeth Munch um, in topology. And everything you're seeing today about the math is coming from uh, Liz Munch. Uh, the work is also done by our former postdoc, Tim Opelders. And the beautiful X-ray CT that you'll see today is by Michelle Quigley. And we're working on barley in collaboration with Dan Koenig and Jason, Jacob Landis at UC Riverside. I'm starting with a picture of a volcano today for a couple reasons. One is that uh, because of the pandemic and immigration, I actually spent most of my time in 2020 in Mexico at my uh, husband's family home in Guanajuato. And this is our backyard. We live on a volcano. Um, but the second reason I want to start with a volcano is because it's the perfect introduction to topology. So topology is about fundamental structural aspects of objects. Uh, some things that are topological are just very simple things. How many things are there? We call this connected components. Or how many holes or loops are there? Um, I think we'd all look at a volcano crater and say there's something interesting topologically. Maybe there's a hole there. But we would all agree that there actually isn't a hole. It doesn't go through the center of the Earth. And so the way that topological data analysis measures shape is that it defines mathematical functions so that we can analyze topological features and use those to measure shape. So the other reason I'm using this as an example is because there's not just one volcano in the region. This region is called uh, La Siete Luminarias. And there's not seven volcanoes. There's actually eight volcanoes and the mountain. So there's nine volcanoes or mountains. And topological data analysis can be applied to any type of data. Remember, all data has shape. There's two things you need for topological data analysis. One is data points. In this case, we're going to use the pixels of the map as our data points. Then we need something called a filter function. The filter function defines a real number value for each data point. In this case, Every pixel, the function we're going to use is elevation. Every single pixel has an elevation, and this will be our function. We're going to use the filter function to connect our data points. And as we connect our data points, we create topological features, and we monitor when these features are born and when they die across the filter function. So what do we mean by that? If we start at the highest values of our filter function, you can see we detect four of the highest mountains and volcanoes at first. So each of these bars represents um, a topological feature. So we have four different things. And you can see for one of the volcanoes, we actually get our loop. So we get one uh, loop or hole. If we go to the next uh, lowest level of elevation, you can still see that we have four things, except that three of two of these things merged and died with another. And so three of these things merged into one. We got two new volcanoes, and one of these volcanoes persisted. So we have four things, but they're different from the four things at the highest elevation. And you can see here that even though the volcanoes are not technically holes, at this particular elevation, we define the values of the filter function so that we detect these eight different craters of the volcano. If we keep on going to lower uh, uh, elevation values, we have more merging, and now we only have three things, and we don't see any more holes, and we keep on going further, and now we just get one big blob, and we see no holes at all. Uh, this was topological data analysis. There's a lot of jargon and terms. Uh, elevation, that was a, a value by a function that we give to every data point. We call that a filter function, or sometimes people call it a lens. It's like a, a, a way to look at your data. Uh, homology refers is unfortunate because in biology, homology is very central to uh, how we do biology. It's the idea that corresponding features 
on organisms that were inherited from a common ancestor. But unfortunately, the topologists also use this word and it refers to different types of topology, things like connected components or loops or voids. And so this is why we call the type of uh, topological data analysis I just showed you persistent homology, because we're looking for persistent topological features. We record the shape and the topological features in these things called persistence barcodes. And the x-axis here is the filter function, which was elevation. And each bar corresponds to either a connected component or a loop. And we monitor when these features are born on the left side and when they die on the right side. These persistence barcodes are a topological signature and they measure very comprehensively the overall shape of the object. We can find the overall similarity of any two persistence barcodes to each other, which is very powerful because we can find the overall similarity of any two shapes to each other. Um, sorry to keep on this example of the volcanoes, but it's it's really important to get this intro into topological data analysis uh, very secure. Another way to think about topology is uh, we're all familiar with networks as biologists. You can think of topology as an evolving dynamic network. Let's say we show the, the seven volcanoes, actually nine volcanoes and mountains as points. Maybe the filter function is not elevation, but just the distance between the points. And we represent that by a growing radius. And you can imagine when two radiuses overlap, we could put in an edge. So for example, if we increase the radius, these volcanoes were all uh, close to each other. So we go from nine connected components to seven as they merge. Uh, things that were farther from each other begin to merge as well. So now we have six connected things. We go further, we have four, two connected things, and we have one connected thing. But you could imagine that we were actually putting in edges between these nodes and that we were creating different types of networks defined by this filter function. And in doing so, we were measuring shape. You don't need to measure, have topology to measure shape. In fact, most of my career, um, I've measured the shape of grapevine leaves. My first job was in wineries uh, in California. Um, and there's a whole field called morphometrics that, that is beautiful in a geometric sense for measuring shape. For example, you can just put equidistant points around an object and this can measure shape. You can take a Fourier transform, um, a harmonic series, and this can measure the overall shape of an object. Or you can use homologous features, things that correspond between all your samples and use these landmarks to measure shape. And grapevines are perfect for this because all Every single grapevine leaf has five major veins and all the veins correspond. And so these orange points all correspond between every type of grapevine leaf. Uh, and then I put a large number of equidistant points between these landmarks in magenta. Uh, these are 6,000 points that make a continuous line. But because they correspond, we can overlap these points and do things like take an average um, of a shape of a grapevine leaf. And these techniques are very powerful when you can use them but it's not always possible to use traditional morphometric techniques. And traditional morphometrics is, is not measuring the totality of the information that is embedded within the shapes of objects. So uh, these are a number of X-ray computed tomography reconstructions, and I'll be talking a lot about X-ray CT today. Uh, when I speak in Mexico, Oh, sorry, I always put examples of uh, Mexican plants because they're way cooler than other plants. Uh, so this is an X-ray CT of a simpasucho, an agave, and a flor de terciopelo. And the way you generate this data is exactly using the same data in your doctor's office. Uh, you generate a 2D scan by placing the plant in front of an X-ray detector, but then you rotate the plant and you take another X-ray CT scan and you keep on making a full rotation and from those many 2D scans of a full rotation, you can create these 3D reconstructions. Each of these is very intensive, large data. It's the data sets you're looking at are cubical. They're made out of voxels. Think of Minecraft, a voxel is a 3D pixel. Uh, these images, when you zoom in, look just like Minecraft. Every voxel has an associated X-ray intensity value. And the resolution of each of these images is, is at least 100 microns. So you've all seen these objects macroscopically, but imagine the data structure that looks like Minecraft behind the scenes that's generating each of these videos. But how would you even begin to measure the shape 
of this data that I'm showing you. You could measure the number of petals or leaves on a simpasucho or an agave. Uh, you can measure their lengths or widths or areas or volumes. But we all know that that's not capturing all the information that we see with our eyes. And so that's why we're using topological data analysis. Imagine if instead of the pixels of a map, we are now using the voxels of an X-ray CT scan. Imagine in our filter function not being um, the elevation or the distance of a pixel to a volcano. In this case, the filter function is X-ray intensity, or maybe the, the filter function is the distance of every voxel to the center of the piña of the agave. Uh, you can imagine then if you went from the highest to the lowest values of the filter function, we could monitor how many different things, loops, voids that there were, and then we could use that to measure the overall similarity of any X-ray CT scan to another. So this is why we're using topological data analysis, because plants are complex, and we now have technology to measure completely what a plant is, like an X-ray CT, but we, we haven't really applied yet uh, the mathematics um, and types of statistics to truly measure the shape uh, in its entirety. And so topological data analysis begins with raw data. We're going to talk a lot about X-ray CT today, but it can also be point cloud data or networks, kind of like the volcanoes or gene expression networks. Um, so we start with raw data. We create a topological summary. You saw something about persistence barcodes. We're going to talk about other summaries uh, like Euler characteristic and mapper graphs. And once you have this summary, you can do all the things we normally do with our data. You can do statistics, machine learning, you can do prediction. So again, the main goal of TDA is to provide a quantifiable, comparable, robust, and concise summary of the shape of data. That is how we measure our data. And TDA has this great motto. It says that shape is data and that all data has shape. And this is the basis of how we're thinking about how we extract the information from the morphology of plants and other objects. So I want to go through uh, an example of trying to apply topological data analysis to the shape of plants. And we have one of our first projects we tried was with barley. So barley is one of the world's most ancient crops. It remains the world's fourth most important grain behind rice, wheat, and corn. It was uh, domesticated in Mesopotamia. And I'm somebody who my favorite plant that I've studied my whole life is grapevines. And of course you make wine from grapes. So if I was to study another plant, I'm happy to study barley because people have been making beer from barley uh, for a very long time. And like all the world's crops, uh, there were wild relatives of barley and they went through a domestication process where their genetic makeup was changed. And of course, these changes in their genetic makeup resulted in changes in morphology, including the spike. And this is just an inflorescence of flowers and it produces the barley seed that we use. And uh, we do know some things about what affects the architecture of the spike. And some of these things change during domestication. Uh, one feature that we know the genetic basis of is that uh, some barley varieties are, uh, are two row and some are six row. And this really affects the overall spike architecture. And I'll come back to this later. So uh, we started working on barley through a collaboration with Dan Koenig at UC Riverside. Dan was able to get his hands on, on a really nice genetic resource and was first published in the 1920s. And this is a long-term evolution experiment. And uh, what these folks did was they took all the uh, land races and, and different types of major barley lines across the world. What I love about barley is that it comes from some of the hottest places in the north of Africa to some of the coldest places uh, like Siberia. They took uh, 28 of these initial parents and they created all possible crosses to create up to 380 hybrids. They then planted out the F2s, the progeny of these hybrids, and uh, they kept on planting out the seeds, collecting them from the field, planting them out again over 50 generations, almost 60 generations in Davis, California. And so we have 60 generations where all these uh, different barley varieties from around the world were crossed with all each other and then uh, their progeny were just put out into a field, allowed to compete, um, and they were collected over, over and over again in this new environment. And potentially, evolution, well, 
probably evolution is happening, right? And so Dan uh, has all the seeds from these generations, and he grows out these barley, sequences their DNA, uses population genetics uh, to analyze which alleles are changing um, and, and what that means with respect to how evolution was, was happening in this population. But we could also measure their morphology. And this is a, a good task for topological data analysis because you might think that the, the changes in shape would be very subtle over 60 generations. So we need a very sensitive method that's measuring shape comprehensively. How do we go about measuring morphology? So this is the X-ray CT scanner. Um, it's managed by Michelle Quigley. It's made by a company called North Star. And basically it's a five ton lead box. And the technology is rather simple. So you have an X-ray generator. Uh, you have this pedestal where the sample is placed and it rotates. And you rotate the sample and you take 2D images at multiple angles. And there's a lot of creativity we use to actually get through the logistics of doing these experiments. All these barley spikes were randomized uh, and measured four at a time. Uh, we use this floral foam because it, it doesn't really impede the x-rays. So you can see that we don't see the foam, we just see the barley. And this slide does not do justice to the amount of work that went into this. Most of our time is not spent implementing topological data analysis. We find a lot of our time is spent on image processing. So I know it doesn't look like there's a lot of difference here, but what this is showing is the raw scan of the spike uh, normalized densities. So there's a histogram of X-ray intensities and there's major peaks of air, barley, uh, and like the floral foam. And we use those peaks to normalize all the X-ray intensities of every scan to another. I know this sounds silly, uh, but actually you have to get rid of the air and the foam uh, by computation. And so that's what this is. And then you segment and prune. And then you end up with this 3D barley spike. And so this is the work of Tim Opelders and Eric Mesquita. And uh, Eric then goes through a heroic effort to isolate 38,000 seeds. And I like these uh, isolated seeds, which were isolated using X-ray intensity, uh, because when you zoom in, you can actually see the cubicle structure. And they look a lot like Minecraft, right? Um, and I think this reminds us that our actual data is cubicle in nature. But there were all these defects. Seeds might be touching each other, or there might be other defects from image processing. And so Eric used something called allometry. Allometry is the differential growth of uh, different features of an organism with respect to size. So as an organism grows, one part of its body might grow faster than another. And usually these relationships are linear. So this is a log transformation of the height of each barley seed to volume or the length to volume. And basically, Eric tried to look for outliers from this linear relationship to detect these bad seeds. Uh, you can see how many seeds in orange he removed per line. But the end result is that we almost have 40,000 seeds that are very clean and a good data set to work with. And then they, uh, Eric used a, a really clever, simple trick to try to find the length, width, and height of these seeds. He just used a principal component analysis. So you've probably used this analysis in your own data analysis. And uh, the major axis of uh, principal component analysis finds uh, the major source of variance in your data because the, the longest axis of the seed is its length. The first principal component axis is the length. The remaining axes are at right angles to the first, uh, but they end up picking up the, the height and the width as well. So based on this, Eric was really quickly able to get the, the length, width, height of each seed, surface areas, volumes, um, and things like that. And then using these very basic measures, um, you can then see how evolution, how these seeds have changed across 60 generations of evolution. Uh, this is a bit of a bad graph, sorry. Uh, the red in zero is the parent generation. Uh, the green is some generation in the middle of the 60 generations, and the blue one is one of the generations at the very end of the experiment. And so you're seeing how these, these seeds change from the parents and across this evolution experiment. And you can see things like height and area are changing. And actually, I'm a bit surprised that we can detect such dramatic changes in the dimensions and the sizes um, of these seeds. And so with Dan Koenig, uh, there's a lot of work that's going to be trying to figure out the genetic basis um, of these evolutionary changes um, and doing a lot of 
uh, population genetic modeling of how evolution is, is working uh, to create these genetic and morphological changes. But that's not what I want to talk about today. What I want to talk about today is how do we fulfill the promise of topological data analysis that we can comprehensively extract the total information from shape? What I just showed you was it's very easy for us to get the dimensions, lengths, widths, heights, surface areas, volumes, areas, no problem. But we all know there's more information than that. So how do we apply topological data analysis to get this extra information? And I'll be talking uh, about an application called the Euler Characteristic Transform. So uh, I consider, I'm not a mathematician, I consider this to be kind of some, some fun math. Uh, the Euler characteristic was developed by Euler um, long ago, uh, a couple centuries ago. He devised a, a number of, of really fundamental mathematical discoveries. I told you that all shapes are data, and you can just think of shapes in one way as a network. And so Euler considered all the platonic solids to be like simple networks or mathematical graphs. And Euler found that if you take the number of vertices minus the edges plus the faces of a platonic solid, that that number will always be two. And you can see topologically that all the platonic solids are the same. They're all just a single uh, blob, right? And so there's also derivations of this formula which say the number of connected components minus the loops plus the voids is equivalent to this Euler characteristic. This Euler characteristic, um, you can imagine topologists get crazy with shapes, uh, lines, circles, filled in circles, spheres, toruses, double toruses, triple toruses, Mobius strips, Klein bottles uh, do, that do very interesting and weird things. The Euler characteristic is a summary, though. Um, it tells us very interesting things about uh, objects that are topologically different. But you can notice from this graph, too, that it is possible for extremely different objects to have the same Euler characteristic, for example, a Mobius strip in a circle. And so an Euler characteristic is an example of a topological signature. It's just a summary. It's just a, a quick number uh, that we can use to find differences between things. I want to take a step back uh, because I'm, I'm telling you now about something that's a topological summary. And I want to tell you why we're using a summary rather than doing it the real way that I told you about before. So from the examples of volcanoes, uh, you can think of uh, your data set as just a set of points, right? And we're using our filter function to put in edges. Our network instead could also be a cubicle complex like an X-ray CT. If we're doing uh, topology the, the more intensive way, we would keep track of each topological feature. So we would keep track of these three different holes independently if we were tracking all the objects at once. If we're doing the Euler characteristic, we're just going to summarize this whole network as a single number. And uh, just to come back to uh, the, the, the very a basic example of topology. Usually this is the example that people give. Uh, there's an overall structure to your data, which is like a ring in this case, but it's also noisy, right? Because data is noisy in the real world. Uh, we're going to use the distance example of a growing radius, and we're going to put in our edges as that radius grows. And so for example, you can see a, a small circle here, one circle. In this example, you see two circles. In this example, you see three, and finally the big ring shows up. And then the final ring persists for a very long time. This example comes from uh, Liz Munch's uh, user guides to topological data analysis. I highly recommend it if you want to learn more about TDA. So in the next slide, uh, we're going to show this example, but as a persistence diagram, where the x-axis is the birth and the y-axis is the death of each of these loops. So you can see here that we have a lot of noise. We, we have these loops that just show up and they die really quick. So they fall on the diagonal. But you can see the big loop, which is the major source of structure in our data, it's born early and it dies very late. It's very far from the diagonal. So if we really want to fully measure uh, all the topological features of an object, we keep track of each single feature. The problem is, is that when you get into an X-ray CT, there's too many features. It starts to be way, it's too computationally intensive. Um, this is an example of an X-ray CT of an orange. And here you're looking at a, a, a persistence barcode, and you're looking at how many things there are, right? 
And this is not even the full representation of all the different objects that are in this orange. But you can see how complex this persistence barcode is. And then ultimately, I told you that we can find the overall similarity of any object to another using these persistence barcodes. The way we do that is we match up features between two data sets. Uh, so these are like two different persistence diagrams of one data set in blue triangles and another in red circles. But we have to look at every pairwise comparison to minimize the, the pairwise distances between each of these objects. And the overall distance between any two things is the largest matched difference. But um, it's really easy for just a few things here to find all their matches. But imagine if you're using something like an orange or a simpasutral. Um, you would have millions of potential topological features. You'd have to run pairwise comparisons to minimize the distances between all topological features. And this would be the only way you could measure the overall similarity of two objects. The Euler characteristic takes, takes advantage of this summary of the Euler characteristic. The Euler characteristic for an object, uh, the filter functions are just the directional axes. So in this case, for a barley seed, we're just showing three different axes. Um, at different thresholds across each axis, you just measure the, the Euler characteristic for the object. And you create these curves, Euler characteristic curves, which is the Euler characteristic at each of the thresholds. And we concatenate and put together these different axes. So we just get this string of numbers of Euler characteristic. This is just a vector. Um, and it's a very simple but uh, good way to measure the shape of an object. There's another more theoretical reason we like this Euler characteristic transform. There's a theorem by uh, Kate Turner, and it says that if you took an infinite number of directions, that the resulting Euler characteristic transforms would be different for different objects. And so the promise of this theorem, which is proved, uh, states that you might be able to reconstruct the original object from a lot of Euler characteristic transforms. And this would be immensely powerful for our analysis of phenotype. Imagine if you could represent the totality of a phenotype of an organism um, as a very large vector of numbers. Uh, this remains to be explored more. Can we use a finite number? And how small is that finite number of directions to completely reconstruct the original object? So let's go back to our barley seeds. Uh, Eric uh, used the Euler characteristic transform. He takes 74 different directions, which you can see in this uh, helical representation here. Uh, they are all corresponding and oriented to the length, width, and height of the seed. He takes 32 thresholds per direction, and this ends up creating a, a huge string of numbers, a vector of over 2,000 numbers. And these 2,000 numbers are a summary of the shape of each seed. He then takes uh, two founders at a time, and he uh, projects this data into a lower dimensional space, a multi-dimensional scaling. And then he uses a method called support vector machine in this uh, multi-dimensional scaling to try to find the best uh, line, a hyperplane, that separates the, the seeds of each of the two parents. So for each of the two parents, he tries to find the best separation he can uh, within this MDS space. And so this line will either correctly or incorrectly classify each of the two parents. And so there's an accuracy associated with this classification. He uses the accuracy as a distance metric. So if uh, it's very uh, easy to separate two of the parents, then they're very far from each other, right? They have very different shapes. But if you're being confused between two of the parents very often, they're much closer. And so you can create these heat maps, which shows the overall similarity of each line to the other. But you can also use it for classification. If I give you a new seed and I don't tell you which parent it comes from, can you predict which parent that seed came from? And so what you're looking at here is the prediction using traditional measures, those things like length, width, height, area, volume. And then you're looking at the classification accuracy using topology. And actually, interestingly, traditional features usually outperform topology. And we think this is because the traditional features are measuring dimensions, size of the objects. And size alone is actually a very good discriminator of seeds. But the topology isn't using size. It's using pure shape. 
But the really interesting result is that if you combine traditional and topological features, these black squares here, you can see that almost always uh, the best classification comes from combining traditional with topological features. Our interpretation of this is that uh, traditional measures are measuring a lot of the information of shape, but you need topology to, to measure that missing aspect of shape. So basically the added accuracy that we have by combining topology of traditional measures, that's attributable to aspects of shape measured by topology that we are not currently measuring when we measure phenotype. Um, you can also use this data for uh, a lot of other traditional analyses. You can do hierarchical clustering. And for example, we were very glad to see, for example, that two and six row barley are being separated uh, mostly. Uh, this is a PCA of two and six, uh, two and six row barley. And uh, this is a bad graph because it's over plotted. But you can see the six row barley kind of forms this heart shape, whereas the two row barley is more centralized. And we think this is because of the left and right spikelets in six row barley uh, that are not aborted in the two row. And this causes some asymmetries of left, right-handed and uh, symmetrical barley seeds. And maybe that's contributing to a lot of the differences uh, we see in the separation of these lines. So that's an introduction to uh, applying topology to a question of uh, measuring biological shape. Um, there's a lot more to do. Um, I'm going to talk in a second about uh, how we might measure the whole uh, panicle, the whole uh, spike beyond the seeds. Uh, of course, we have to look at the, the relationship of integrating this topology data with genetics um, and using topology in a more traditional trait-based way of, of trying to investigate the genetic basis of uh, form. Uh, but there's also a whole lot of other plants, and we've taken a lot of scans. And so I want to talk about kind of where we're going in the future. Uh, we measured the seeds, but of course there's there's beautiful shapes uh, beyond the seeds. Uh, another way to summarize topological information besides something like the Euler characteristic is something called a mapper graph. So this creates a network-based representation of your data. It works using the original data structure, uh, an example case here, a filter function, which is just a directional axis here. But then there's these added cover intervals. And so these cover intervals overlap with each other and the cover intervals take ranges of values of the filter function. Uh, points that fall within the filter function values for each interval get assigned to different groups. And then you do clustering on these different groups. So this is, uh, in this uh, block, there's only one group. In this block, there's two. And in this block, there's one. And these create the nodes. But because the intervals overlap, if points are found in both of the bins, then they get assigned to an edge. And so this is a way that you can create a, a simple network representation of a shape. So if we go to our barley spikes, if our filter function is the rachis along the spike, you can see that this picks up on the ons of the spike very well. Um, but we could choose a different filter. We could choose X-ray intensity. And in this case, the seeds are very prominent, right? And so the network is more about seeds that are connected to a hub that represents uh, the, the rachis. Um, I talked a little bit about that we have this problem that we want to solve. Given topological signatures, could we go back to the original object? With these mapper graphs, that is not a problem. And the reason is because there's data points that correspond to each edge and each node. And so you can exactly say for each node, uh, what are the data points that correspond to that? Um, and you can have these fun interactive structures uh, exploring the network that you created. Uh, I bring up these mapper graphs because um, I focus a lot on shape. Shape and form is the thing that fascinates me. But you can also apply it to any data set, uh, as I told you before. And uh, a lot of people, a lot of biology focuses on gene expression. And it would be nice if we actually use the same methods to analyze gene expression as we use to analyze phenotype. So these are two examples of applying a mapper to gene expression. Uh, in this example, the underlying data is a pairwise correlation matrix. That's the overall distance of each data point to each other. It's microarray data from breast cancer samples. And the authors use as their filter a model of how far each sample is from a healthy uh, tissue. So healthy tissues are in blue, and the filter goes all the way to red to uh, cancer samples. 
And the using the mapper graph, the authors found a data structure that they wouldn't have found that they did not see with principal components analysis or hierarchical clustering. They saw this bifurcation in the graph. And so this told them as the disease progresses that there's two different outcomes. And then they went back to the data and they found that different cancer samples had different genotypes. And these were associated with different disease outcomes. So this is an example where topology shows you something that you wouldn't have found using the traditional approaches that we use. Another nice example is using single cell RNA-seq data. So this is data where we take a, a, a transcriptome of each individual cell. People use, uh, and you've probably seen them, PCAs, MDS plots, or T-SNEs of the data, and they try to find groups of genes. But making a mapper graph, you actually create a true network. And I think this is closer to the representation of how we think about cell lineages. Um, and so these are just two examples of how topology can give us insights into non-shaped data, things like gene expression. Uh, we also have scanned uh, most of the world citrus. This is in collaboration with Danelle Seymour from the UC Riverside collection. Here we want to get a lot more into image analysis to isolate different parts of our samples, like the exocarp, the mesocarp, and the endocarp. But I also want to, to use this as an example because I think topological data analysis through the use of filter functions allows us to look at our data in a way that we define. We define the mathematical filter function and it, it gives us control over how we're defining these topological features. And remember, we're using topological data analysis not only for complicated data sets like X-ray CT, but also because traditional morphometrics cannot handle some of the unique shapes of plants like branching. And I think branching as a metaphor, a mathematical metaphor, allows us to potentially see, see the world in new ways that we haven't considered before. So for example, this is a, uh, believe it or not, an orange. Uh, it's an angular projection of an orange. So uh, this is, uh, the y-axis is from the top to the bottom of the citrus. And the x-axis here is the angular projections taking the average x-ray intensity at each angle. So it's kind of like you unwrap the orange. The filter function here is geodesic distance. This is the distance of each voxel to the base of the orange, except that that distance is weighted so that the higher the x-ray intensity, the shorter the path. And this kind of creates canalization. All the distances of all these voxels tend to go through the vasculature. And what you're looking at here is for each voxel, how many paths go through it. And you can see it, it gives this beautiful branching representation of what an orange is. Even though an orange is, we don't think of it as a branching object, mathematically you can think of it as a, as a very intricate branching object that measures this overall shape. This work was inspired by Tim Oppelders. Uh, he previously worked on satellite data, trying to measure the shape of deltas and braided rivers. And I just want to put this out there that um, if we explore these mathematical approaches more like topology, that there are, there are beautiful and creative ways that I think we're missing uh, that we can look at the world um, and consider it in new ways. Um, we also really want to, in the long term, uh, plants are not just 3D objects, they're 4D objects. They grow through time. And so uh, a direction we really want to go into is looking at growing phenotypes and creating time lapses of both plants and time lapses of their underlying gene expression networks. So this project is looking at um, plasticity and how plants respond to different light regimens, and also developmental reproducibility, the variability of different genotypes in different environments. This is in collaboration with the Man Husbands at Ohio State, Baranda Montgomery at uh, Michigan State, and Arjun Krishnan and Liz Munch um, at Michigan State as well. Um, and in fact, we actually have a job posting for a postdoc um, to implement this map and analysis of X-ray CTs and gene expression. Um, and it will be closing this week. So if you want to apply, you better hurry. The job number is here. So um, I want to end by saying that I hope I convinced you that uh, topology is uh, critical and important for measuring shape, for measuring phenotype. But I also hope that I convinced you that it truly can be applied to any type of data set. And there's so many data sets that have uh, a spatial or pattern or architecture component to them. Uh, point data, things like bacterial distributions, LIDAR, epidemiology, spray, uh, pathology. 
shapes, structures, and patterns, soil structures, uh, little microenvironments, niches, particle shapes and sizes, plant morphology, things like hyperspectral data, branching and graph-like and network structures, roots, hyphae, canopies, plant growth, any type of network, including gene expression networks. Um, so there are many applications, and I hope that topology becomes more widespread in its application in the plant sciences. Uh, so thank you. Uh, these are all the folks that I introduced to you at the beginning of the presentation that uh, contributed uh, to everything that you saw today. And I just want to end by saying that if you want to learn more about topology, um, we created a uh, review. It's called The Shape of Things to Come, Topological Data Analysis and Biology from Molecules to Organisms. Uh, it's in developmental dynamics, um, and you can read more about uh, for biologists about how we might apply topology to biology. And also, I find as we come together uh, trying to bring mathematics into plants, that this is truly a cultural problem. We have two completely different disciplines, and we talk in different ways, we communicate in different ways, we have different sets of values. And so um, I'm also investing a lot in education and not necessarily the math, but also getting uh, plant biologists um, all coding and kind of in the same perspective with respect to modeling and coding. And so we have this NSF research traineeship program uh, called NRT. Um, it's called IMPACTS, Integrated Training Model in Plant and Computational Sciences. But I've made all the, the materials publicly available on GitHub in this uh, repository, Plants and Python. And there's these Jupyter Notebooks and Python, and there's a YouTube video that tells you how to load uh, Python and Jupyter Notebooks if you want to start from scratch. Uh, we teach very basic coding um, learning concepts, but for plants. So for example, we teach loops uh, by calculating the golden angle and then making models of sunflower growth with it. We teach functions uh, by looking at fractal ferns and things like L systems. And then we do, uh, data analysis too and visualization. So we look at data sets of the harvest dates of grapes um, across 300 years of data of Europe uh, as the climate warmed and how this affected the harvest date of grapes. And we of course look at leaf shape and things like that. So if you uh, have the need to learn coding or want to look at some more of that data, uh, you could uh, go to that uh, GitHub repository. Uh, so thank you very much. Thanks a lot, Dan, for a wonderful seminar. Uh, so we are going to start the uh, uh, questions session, questions and answer session. But first of all, I want to uh, put here the comment of Tatiana Arias, who says uh, amazing images. Tatiana Arias is uh, uh, connected from Medellin, Colombia, I guess. And I just want to remind the audience that we, if you have questions in Spanish, we can also translate them. So please, please feel free to, to put your questions on the, on the chat. So um, we have the first question from Professor Martin Ricker, uh, who thanks you for your presentation. And he asked you, have you tried to identify and distinguish species based on shape, maybe leaf shape? Yes, I have. Um, actually, uh, most of my work is using non-topological approaches of morphometrics, um, and especially with uh, grapevine and passiflora. I've definitely at the genus level gone into a lot of detail of how you would use morphometric approaches to distinguish species, but also with a developmental angle. So we try to collect the leaves as they develop across a vine. And we try to incorporate this developmental information also in that classification between species. But we have applied topology on a much broader scale across all angiosperm leaves. And so there's this uh, really well and really cool relationship between uh, the serrations of leaves and the ancient climatic temperatures millions of years ago. Uh, more serrations are correlated with colder, drier climates. And so the ecologists had collected this immense data set of uh, leaves from across uh, most angiosperms. And we applied topological data analysis to, to that data set because it was just so broad that we couldn't use traditional morphometric approaches. And definitely at um, a level of families and um, also different locations and latitudes across the, the planet, we tried to distinguish uh, genetically where species are coming from at a family level um, and also uh, environmentally too. But that data set could be extended to lower levels like species um, as well. Leaf shape, so you know, as 
probably most people know is very, it changes a lot during evolution. Um, and so it's very good actually for distinguishing a uh, high resolution uh, classification of species and subspecies and varieties like for grapevine. Um, and it becomes a little more difficult when you go broader because it's changing so often. But yes, you can use both morph metrics and TDA to try to distinguish species. Uh, we have another question from Tatiana, Tatiana Arias. Are this type of data more informative than classical morphological data in terms of evolution of morphological characters? And um, if you uh, allow me, uh, I want to link it with my, one, one of the questions I was gonna ask you, something that we have discussed in the past, how do we know what evolutions, what natural selection sees? You know, on the one hand, you are quantifying shape. On the other hand, well, we have natural selection. What do we need enable, uh, what do we need in order to be able to link these two things? Yes, and this is a profound question. And actually, I, I would like to thank Tatiana because I think she was the editor for the paper I mentioned in Frontiers of um, looking at the shape of all the angiosperm leaves uh, using topological data analysis. And this is a fundamental question. The way I see it, and I'm going to get to your question, Ulysses, is that on one hand, we have very specific measures of shape. Um, lengths, widths, heights, specific features. Morphometrics is also this way too, right? It has specific landmarks. And this is the power of using non-topological approaches that you know exactly what you're working with. And so I, I, we, we talked about this often, what is natural selection working on? I think we have a number of proxies of how we would answer that question. For example, heritability. This, this would be one quick test I would use. If I had 100 traits before me, I would probably first look to heritability just to know what is at least genetically specified more than being not genetically specified, right? Because it has to be genetic if it's under natural selection. That's just one example of how we could test which trait is truly under natural selection. The problem, though, with using traditional approaches is that they're kind of arbitrary and they don't measure the total shape of what an organism is, right? And so that's what topology addresses. Here we have a method that truly measures all the information content as defined by a filter function. And it can measure the overall similarity of any two things to each other. The problem we run in with topology then is people ask, well, what does it mean when two things are overall similar to each other? And this is gonna be a long-term question that we have to address. I showed you a little bit of how we find the overall topological similarity of two objects. We try to find the minimum pairwise distance of every topological feature to another, right? That's one example of how we could actually mathematically try to say these are features that correspond between different objects. And this could start to be more closer to the concept of trait like we currently have. And then we could, once we have that concept of trait, then we could apply things like heritability and make much more stringent hypotheses. Is natural selection acting more or less for these different features? We still have a problem that topology is a way that most human beings don't think in. I would argue though that it is more mathematically rigorous than a lot of the way we currently define traits. Um, so yes, we have a lot of uh, problems of how we conceptualize these things. I was trying to get a little into this in the barley to try to use uh, classification and prediction on traditional features and topological features. Um, and kind of where I was coming with that though is like, what is the missing information that topology can measure that traditional features are not? Uh, but otherwise traditional and topological methods are hard to compare. So th this is really at the heart of the question of where do we go in the future and how do we more fully implement what is obviously a powerful mathematical approach, but how do we make it applicable to all the existing theory we have for evolution um, and how that functions? Thanks, Dan. We have a question from Emilio Petrone, who is a PhD student in our institute. He works with Mark Olson. He says, thank you very much for your talk, Dan. And the question is, actually it's two questions. In topologi topological da data analysis, how many images are the standard to perform analysis? Uh, and the continuation is, for example, how many images of barley seed variant are needed to identify differences and more variants? 
Well, that's a, that's a sliding question. Um, you can use few, you can use many. Uh, the barley was nice because there are so many seeds we isolate from each image. So we did not have to worry about replication. Uh, but usually I find that the typical numbers that we, we use, because um, more is always better, of course, right? It's just how much can you actually practically measure? But I find that it's it's actually kind of similar to what we use with traditional analyses. Like I would start probably at three or five, right, at least. But I would increase that much more. Um, and of course, that number has to be very high if two things are very similar to each other, right? Um, if two things are completely different, you don't need much replication at all. So I, I think a lot of the same uh, things we consider with traditional data analysis apply for topology too. OK, thank you, Dan. Uh, Daniel Franco, who is a PhD student as well in the Botanical Garden, he works with Salvador Arias. And he's asking, uh, what would be the greatest contribution of TDA to the field of study of plant physiology? Um, yeah, how, how do you link to, to plant physiology? This is something that I really want to do in the future. Um, you can see that, um, and Elise's just kind of got at this too, that I'm somebody who just measures the shape of things but I'm always looking for application. I'm always looking to model this information in terms of something. And so this is exactly where I hope to go into the future, um, that if physiology is just very functional, right? And so if we can find good examples of where we have very good functional data, like plant physiology, I would love to model that in terms of shape. Some examples, uh, leaves, for example, you could imagine that if you're picking up on the vasculature and it's branching, that there's a lot of hydraulic relationships immediately between the shape of the vasculature of the leaf and like uh, hydraulics, and you could model this using plant physiology data. Another example is not quite plant physiology, but we've measured all the walnuts. Uh, this is with Pat Brown at UC Davis. But after we got done scanning the walnuts, we sent them back to him, and then he measured, uh, he's a walnut breeder, and he measured uh, how much force it takes to break the shell. And he also measured as a trait how much the walnuts split. And so this is really functional data we have for each object we measured. And so this is addressing a lot of the questions that I, I was talking about before. As long as you have a model for this data, I think it's very interpretable. Because in that sense, it's kind of like face recognition or other machine learning approaches. Uh, we don't necessarily focus on a single feature, but we have an immense amount of information that we can feed into models and make them better based creating these uh, relationships between function and shape. So yes, the only limitation is a good question and a good application with functional data. And we hope to have more of that in the future. Thanks. We have a comment from Pablo Cabanillas, who thinks your talk is amazing, and that we botanists need to understand and work close to mathematicians. There is a lot of possible synergies with all systems, topology, cybernetics, fractals. And actually, I just want to mention that most of our biology students are studying next to mathematicians uh, and to physicists at the School of Sciences. So, um, and somehow the synergy hasn't come, uh, hasn't come together. So what, what do you recommend? Uh, what, what shall we do to promote this synergy between these disciplines? First of all, uh you're right on target that L systems, fractals are completely related. Something I would love to do, for example, is to create an L system space, generate automatically a space of millions of different trees uh, using L systems, right? Uh, a very simple filter we use for topology is geodesic distance. It's the path along the actual tree to its base. And you can imagine if you have a tree, that if you start at the highest levels of geodesic distance, you have all these little branches, right? But eventually the branches merge. So you have two things and they go to one. So trees are a very easy topological signature. And someday I would love to, to create an artificial data set of lots of trees using L systems and explore the overall relatedness of different trees resulting from L systems uh, with a topological data analysis approach. Um, but in, in terms of um, the synergy, I actually find, and this is what kind of why I meant a little bit about education at the end, I find that it's actually a, a cultural difference. Um, that a lot of botanists and plant biologists, that maybe they haven't had the chance to be introduced to L systems or fractals, or um, they don't know how to go about it. And I, I find this kind of lack of appreciation between the two fields being the real problem. 
I want to say that this collaboration we have with Liz Munch, who's a topologist, has been the best thing in the world. Um, it really takes two people that are committed to coming together from very different perspectives of how to describe reality uh, to try to make this bridge. For example, and there's a lot of things, so plant biologists, at least I, love the mathematics because it's so powerful to explain complex phenomena in this world. On the other hand, though, we as plant biologists can't be too shy. We have a lot to offer math, uh, philotaxy, for example. But uh, people who do topology love networks. And basically, trees are living networks, right? Um, th th this is real, natural world application that mathematics can be applied to. So I, I think it just takes coming together, talking, and making that bridges. I know it's hard. But being paired up and talking between mathematicians and plant biologists is exactly the way we're going to make these bridges happen. We're glad that we have a student in the audience from Honduras. And he says, very interesting talk, super interesting talk. And he's asking, once you transform shape data into complex and cohomology groups and Betty numbers, uh, no, um, are, com are cohomology group and Betty numbers difficult to calculate? Not so much. Um, I mentioned we, we have real problems eventually with computation because we're dealing with such complex data. But the actual um, the actual Betty number for the audience, the Betty numbers are basically a, a count of, that's a simplification, but they're kind of like a count of just the topo different topology groups. How many connected components? How many loops? How many voids? Um, that's not so hard. Um, it does become problematic to create these uh, persistence barcodes or diagrams. You have to start keeping track of the birth and death of all the objects. And where we really get into problems is calculating the bottleneck distance. Um, and again, that's the overall similarity between two topological signatures. And the reason that that is so computationally intensive is because you have to calculate, the, you have to minimize the, the distances between matches of every topological feature, right? And that is just uh, a computationally intensive problem. And so that's why we, we go to Euler characteristic. Um, but yes, th there, there are computational problems eventually in topology with the application to data, uh, but probably not so much in the actual calculation of the Betty numbers themselves, but more in the calculation of persistence. OK. We have a question from Lorena Villanueva, who is asking, how easy would it be to collect data from soil roots or canopies to analyze using data topological tools? Seed and some fruits can fit into the North Star scanner, or what, are, what about other structures? I mean, what, what are the limitations of your technology? Yeah, the, the scanner is pretty big, but it's, uh, it does have limitations. It does have to fit in that box. Um, so we have about like a, a two foot diameter that we can feasibly uh, take an X-ray CT scan. And it becomes very interesting because the actual detector is only about like eight to 10 inches or so. But the way you take a, a, a big scan is you just move the detector and you like make like a three by three stitched together image. Uh, so they take time, but we can do huge objects. We do have a project. Soil is a perfect example. And we actually have some people using the X-ray scanner that put their soil cores in the X-ray scanner. And it's the perfect size for soil cores. And as you can imagine, topological data analysis is perfect for looking at something that's really complex, like a texture of a soil, right? Uh, lots of folks are using it for roots. Um, that's a really difficult application, especially for uh, imaging the roots within soil because the X-ray intensity is based on um, the material impeding the X-rays. But as a living tissue and the soil, they're both mostly water, right? And so what happens is that living roots and soil are this hard problem, but it's important to look at roots in their natural environment. And people have really advanced computation to try to extract those uh, roots. Canopies? Um, that's obviously too big for the scanner, but something I would love to do in the future is scan like a branch or leaves. And then imagine if you could like combine with something like L systems, which correctly represents a tree or a branching structure, you could maybe synthetically or generatively try to recreate a, tr uh, a rainforest or something like that, right? Uh, that's ambitious for the future. Uh, but yes, uh, we're, we're trying to scan as much as we can, and it's really fun to try to get all sorts of different diverse plant materials into that scanner. 
Thank you, Lorena. And uh, now we have a question from Hernan Vasquez Miranda, who is our ornithology specialist, uh, project sign project leader in our institute. And he's asking about how much storage and computer processing power do you need to analyze X-ray data for an average single project? And I want to follow up on this on this uh, question. How much is one of these, uh, you know, toys? How, how much? How much does it cost? How much? What, what does it take to get one of those things? So I'll start out with the the cost of the whole thing. It, it is an expensive and uh, very intricate piece of equipment. But also, I want to say that it is comparable to the other important pieces of equipment that we routinely use in biology. So. The total cost of these instruments is probably somewhere between half a million to $750,000. But also that's the same price or cheaper than, for example, a really nice confocal microscope, right? Um, so these technologies really are um, expensive, but also within the range of other equipment that we use within biology. I would also like to say that the technology itself is the same that people routinely use at synchrotrons or other radiation sources. And in fact, those instruments can give you way higher resolution than we can get on our instrument. It's just that the, the throughput and the size of the thing you can scan is much less. And it's also harder to get access to something like a synchrotron, right? Um, storage and, and computer processing power. Oh, included in that bill, though, is also um, it looked very humble in the picture. It looked like a desktop computer, but it was also basically a GPU supercomputer. Um, so the reconstruction of these things is not something you can just put onto a normal server unless it has lots of GPU processing power. So we purchased that actual local computer for the reconstructions themselves uh, with the instrument. Uh, so that's not something you can just put onto any sort of server. But once you have the reconstructions, that's just normal data. And we do run into storage issues, um, but they're not insurmountable. So a normal data set of like, um, like 800 barley spikes or something like that. Um, each scan is multiple gigabytes and together a very kind of typical larger experiment we do is, is on the scale of a couple terabytes. So it, it's not like unmanageable data, but it is big data, right? Um, and at the moment we're, we're trying to figure out various storage solutions. Uh, something we want to do is on that volcano where I live in Guanajuato, uh, there's these Dora Diaz, the, the resurrection Slaginellas. Um, and we really want to take a time lapse where we, we watch the Slaginella resurrect, but we take like a scan like every two minutes, right? But we first need to like clear our local computers so that we could take like a couple hundred scans and just store them in some place. So yes, storage and processing are things to consider, um, but they're not insurmountable challenges, especially with the computing power we have uh, for our time. Excellent. Uh, we have a question from Marcelo Pasch, who is a botanist in our institute. He's a specialist on wood anatomy. Uh, he says, I imagine these techniques also open new avenues to compare fossils to their current relatives. Is, is that correct? That is uh, very correct. Uh, you can take scans of fossils. Uh, when we were first uh, operating this instrument, we scanned everything that we could get our hands on. We scanned um, a lot of trilobites in uh, rocks and things like that. Um, yes. Uh, and in fact, I, I think the current use of X-ray CT is more towards the museum and natural collection sides of things, where museums scan a lot of their cultural or also uh, paleontolo paleontological samples, uh, things like fossils. Um, so it's actually, I think, kind of more novel to try to take x-rays of living things. Uh, but yes, fossils are, are cool things to x-ray scan. Cool. So we have a question from uh, Hector, again, from the Universidad Honduras. Uh, once you transform shape into complexes, are the, com are, are the cohomology groups and Betty numbers hard to compute? No, I think that's maybe the previous or kind of a, a follow-up question, but yes, uh, no. Uh, but like we said, the, the computation itself of persistence is very difficult. Okay, we have another, another question from uh, Pablo Cabanillas. How topology deals with ontogenetical constraints due to changes in shape associ associated to size? This is something um, I, I really want to investigate in the future. 
um, you saw that I, we were doing traditional allometry calculations, but it was on traditional data. Um, and I also mentioned that traditional measures outperform topology, but I suspect that that's only because we were normalizing topology to size. So you can normalize for size in topology, just like you do with normal data. Uh, for example, those Euler characteristic curves, right? Um, you can either let them go as long as they want to for the size of the object. Imagine if your filter is X-ray intensity, but you have a big seed and a small seed. You can imagine that there's a larger range of the filter function values you have to go through for a large versus a small seed. Or after you calculate that, that curve, you could normalize them all to the same range, right? And this essentially eliminate size. And so um, I think it's the same problem we have for morphometrics, that we are measuring size information together with the shape information. And there are ways that we can either normalize or not normalize uh, for size. So I think it's, it's a lot of this. Yes, you can uh, look at size information to study things like allometry and other developmental constraints, um, or you don't. And I think there's the, the same techniques we use in morphometrics to deal uh, with size versus shape. Excellent. Um, Ariel Hernandez, who is a student from the Institute of Biotechnology in Cuernavaca, UNAM, uh, she's asking, I was wondering if this type of analysis could be applied to study the development of tissues such as mesophyll or other bland tissues, other bland structures. And actually I want to follow up on this. How small can you go? Can you see cells? Can you see tissues? Yes, and uh, I don't know if it meant gland structures or bland structures, but I would not call mesophylls bland at all. Um, you can go quite small, and it depends on the machine. So uh, we run into kind of uh, an ultimate size resolution of probably around two to three microns, but there are things called micro CT scanners. And in fact, uh, they're smaller and they're cheaper and they fit on a bench um, and they go to higher resolutions. Um, it's just that they, they scan smaller volumes. So in all X-ray CT, there's a trade-off between volume and resolution that you can do. But there are uh, instruments, there's X-ray CT microscopes, and they go down to nanometer resolutions, um, almost like as close to light microscopy. Um, for seeing cells, that, that's an issue. So one, we're not quite at the resolution with our instrument to do that properly. But two is that we're not dealing with visible light, right? So you have to remember we're dealing with X-ray uh, X-ray intensities, and that's very different from how we like visualize things with microscopy. And that has to do with the density of things. Like I said before, cells are mostly bags of water, so it's hard to see them. But with the right contrasting agents and high resolution X-ray CT microscopes, you can see cells, and and those are very beautiful uh, data sets. And for oh, sorry, for mesophyll cells and all that. Uh, because there's points, imagine if you had a, a point at the centroid of each cell, uh, you could use topology easily to measure the shapes and patterns of cells. And people do this all the time uh, in cancer biopsies to try to like distinguish cancer using uh, machine learning from biopsies and pathology. And in plants, people have, uh, there's many labs who have created beautiful X-ray CT reconstructions at the cellular level of mesophylls. And that's another example of where there's a, a very close uh, functional relationship with physiology. So yes, you can get that resolution. You can look at cells in the right context. Um, and those are beautiful types of data. Thanks a lot, Dan. Uh, we don't have any more questions. We only have comments. Uh, everyone congratulating you for your amazing talk. Um, hopefully, you will have the chance to, to look at the, at the chat in YouTube later on. Um, in the meantime, I just want to put the uh, Dan's website, uh, Morphology Lab, uh, in uh, Michigan State University. So in case any of the audience wants to get in touch with Dan, Dan is a super nice person, always happy to collaborate, and, and I'm sure you can get more information from his research in his webpage. So thanks a lot, Dan, for, for this wonderful talk, and, and hopefully one day, hopefully soon, uh, we'll, get, we'll have you in Mexico City, perhaps giving another seminar or teaching a course. Thank you so much for the invitation, and I'm looking forward to being in person in Mexico City. Okay, everyone, so thanks a lot to all the audience who follow those in real time or in the later time. We invite you to follow our seminar series in, YouTube, in the YouTube channel for many more interesting seminars to come. And I just want to say that next week uh, we have Professor Martin Garcia Varela, 
uh, on the 2nd of February, who is going to be hosted by Dr. Alejandro Seguera. In addition, I just want to uh, tell you that we have announced the Frontiers in Systematics, Biodiversity and Evolution Seminar Series. So we are very pleased, uh, we, are, we, are, we are very excited to have this new seminar. And, uh, stay tuned for, for we're going to be announced in this website that is here. En tiempo, ya lo que nos ve en otro momento, los invitamos a que se suscriban a nuestro canal de seminarios del Instituto de Biología para que reciban las notificaciones de nuestros próximos seminarios institucionales, los cuales se llevan a cabo cada martes a las 11 de la mañana, tiempo de la Ciudad de México. El próximo seminario será impartido por el doctor Martín García el 2 de febrero a las 11 Alejandro Seguera Figueroa. De, de anunciar una serie de seminarios que se llaman Fronteras en Sistemática, Biodiversidad y Evolución del Instituto de Biología de la UNAM. Les dejo aquí en la pantalla el vínculo de la página web para que estén atentos de, las, de los títulos de los seminarios y las dinámicas que estaremos planeando con algunos de estos conferencistas. Con esto damos por terminada la sesión. Eh, with this, eh, we finish the session. En salud, and to all the people who, who Bye-bye. Bye, everybody.